Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 143. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Hey, everybody, it's Laura Reagan. Wanting to let you know that if you are interested in doing a deep dive into the Daring Way work, which is based on the research of Brene Brown on authenticity, vulnerability, courage, trust, and connection and relationships, you can join Charlotte Heiler Easley and I in Lexington, Kentucky on October 5th and 6th for a two-day retreat intensive combining the Daring Way with Charlotte's work, Relational Equine Assisted Learning. Yes, you heard that right. We are doing a two-day retreat combining the Daring Way with working on trust and connection, boundaries, vulnerability, and authenticity through work with horses. It's an unbeatable combination. We had an amazing experience last November, 2017, when we did two one-day retreats and we wanted to expand to offer two days because we can go deeper in two days and everybody loved the, the one day so much. So, Join us in Lexington, Kentucky, October 5th and 6th. Best pricing ends on August 1st, but we still have discounted rates available after that as well. And to register and get all the details, go to lauraregan.lcswc.com slash retreat. If you want to understand more about why we are doing these retreats and what you can expect to gain from them. Listen to episodes 55, 56, 123, 133, and 139. I talked with Charlotte twice in episodes 56, 133, which was a replay, and 139. And I talked with Julia Alexander, who is another therapist using work with equines in trauma-focused therapy in 123. And in episode 55, I talked about my own experience the first time I connected with myself in deep connection with a horse and how it was really a powerful experience that changed everything for me. It's been two years. It's still just as memorable and just as poignant for me. And I want to share that experience with you. So if you want to join us, you can go to lauraregan.lcswc.com slash retreat, get all the information. There's a payment plan and I hope we'll see you there. Hey, Laura Reagan here. It's July and I'm on hiatus, but I wanted to share with you some past interviews, which you may have missed but I think you will really benefit from listening to whether you're a therapist or just a human being who cares about your own emotional experience and the emotional experience of people you love. You're going to hear me talking with Rebecca Wong, LCSWR, who is in the Hudson Valley of New York about trust, play, attachment, and being seen. Rebecca is now the host of the very successful podcast, The Practice of Being Seen, where she talks about a lot of subjects in great depth. And I really enjoyed our conversation about how attachment and trust and play go together in relationships. I think you'll get a lot out of it too. Love to hear your feedback. So please feel free to go to my website, therapychatpodcast.com. Click on the speak pipe button and you can leave a message letting me know what you think. Thanks. 
Therapy Chat Podcast wouldn't exist without the support of its listeners. If you'd like to become a member, please go to patreon.com slash therapy chat. By making a $1 per month donation, you can help Therapy Chat keep going over the long haul. Thank you for your support. Hi, welcome to Therapy Chat. Today, my guest is a wonderful clinical social worker, Rebecca Wong, who is a friend and colleague of mine living in New Paltz, New York. Rebecca, thank you so much for being on Therapy Chat today. Oh, hi, Laura. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. I'm so happy too. We've known each other for a few years and become better friends more recently through online means. And we haven't yet met in the real world, but I feel like soon. (laughs) Yes, we will. We definitely will. And I've just been watching your work evolving. You are connectfulness and that is your brand and your work with couples. So can you start just telling us first a little bit about you and your work? Sure. So I'm a clinical social worker. I do mostly relationship work with couples, mostly with parenting couples. And so much of my work is about rediscovering, helping parents and couples rediscover intimacy, playfulness, and meaning in their lives. I'm a mother myself um, and I'm married to my husband for now just about 10 years this fall. And life is an adventure when we let it be, or it can be really overwhelming when we're kind of not paying attention to looking for that adventure. And so that that space of inspiration of finding the adventure, that's kind of where I live and what I try to help my couples find their way back to. It's so interesting. I mean, even what you just said, you're you're talking about finding meaning and you know, you I think people talk a lot about love, but <laughs> connection and deep meaning is it's part of love, but it's something people don't often think about. Yeah, it's, you know, we, we think that love should come easy to us, that it should be like a storybook, that it should be what we see in the movies and that our relationship shouldn't take any work. But I really believe that that's a fallacy. And I think we do ourselves a disservice when, when we don't put in the work to create the relationships that we desire. Yeah, people often say maybe this relationship wasn't meant to be or she or he is not the one. Because this seems so hard. Yeah. There, you know, I think there could be a lot of different the ones for each and every one of us. But we find we find our own imperfections in our partners. We see ourselves and in those moments where we where we get to see those reflections reflected back to us, even in the icky parts that we don't really like, and in the really awesome parts that make us feel cherished and wonderful, all of that we have opportunities to constantly evolve and to grow. And that's, I believe, what relationships are all about. It's about creating a safe place to grow together. Hmm. Yeah. You know, I just, that's so interesting. You just made me think about, and this totally makes sense. It's almost like, why didn't I see this before? But it's like, you know, you're born and the attachment that you have makes you develop as a child and your emotional development is all related to that. And then when you partner up, with the love person, you know, the love figure for your adult life that just helps you continue to grow through your life. It may not even be with only one person throughout your life, but that's how you continue to grow. Oh, that's just, really that just hit me hard. Yeah. It's all (laughs) attachment stuff. You know, we, we attach as, as infants and we keep attaching and playing out those attachment bonds throughout the rest of our life. That's so true. Oh, Mm -hmm. so interesting. So when you first started talking about your work, you mentioned play. Mm -hmm. How does play relate to connection and relationships? (laughs) I love this question. (laughs) So (laughs) play helps you find your way back to security. Play is the place where when you feel really secure in your your relationships, you're going to have the strength and the courage to evolve in all the other aspects of yourself, where you're going to be able to work through the icky, messy, not feeling so good stuff and come back to each other. Without the play, you're going to get stuck in a loop that doesn't feel good and you're going to stop evolving, at least stop evolving together. So play, I like to say, is the glue. It's what keeps you in the relationship. So what happens when people don't feel secure enough in the relationship 
to be able to play because I feel like play is very vulnerable. You really have to let your guard down. You do. But I, I think that one of the places people don't feel safe is in noticing themselves and in noticing their own pattern. Sometimes it's about the relationship and it's more externalized. I don't feel safe with this person because sometimes, you know, Laura, you're the, you're the trauma expert. So there are so many different stories that we bring with us and collect throughout our lives, both from things we've witnessed, from things we've experienced, from our, you know, within all different kinds of relationships, whether they be in our childhood or in our adult relationships, maybe they're with your particular partner now, or they're with someone from the past. So all of the intersections of those stories affect how you see your current relationship and how it's, for the pardon the pun, but playing out in your life. And when we can kind of sit with ourselves and our own process in there and see all the uncomfortable, icky feelings that come up for us, what part of it is that it's hard for us to sit with and what part of it is the stuff that's playing out externally. So that own observation of ourselves can sometimes be the hardest part of getting back to play because that's the part that's hard to sit with. That's the part that most people don't feel safe with. Yeah. So I like you to talk a little bit more about that, about how we say, oh, you know, I'm not sure if I can feel safe with this person because, you know, not, and I'm not talking about an abusive relationship, but more where for some reason you aren't allowing yourself to trust that person. Um, you're not feeling comfortable enough to, to trust, which is again, you know, one of the most vulnerable things is to trust someone. And so how does our, our icky stuff relate to that? We often have stories that trace back um, sometimes decades and many decades, and they look back, they might even be transgenerational. They might've been passed down from generation to generation, even before us about what we can trust and what we can't trust. And so we need to develop an understanding of those stories in order to really look at trust. Because so often trust is not just about the interplay between the two of you right here in the moment. It's, it's, a foundation that's laid in a really, really deep story. And so when we, when we play with trust, you know, I used to, this is going back for myself, it's going back decades, but I used to facilitate outdoor education courses and experiential ed. And one of the things I used to guide people through was trust falls, right? And so that's where you're standing kind of really stiff, like a board and your partner is behind you and they kind of tap you on the shoulders and they're standing in a really solid stance with one foot in front of the other grounded. They have their thumbs together and they're just kind of like waiting there for you. And they let you know when it's okay to go and you just lean back ever so slightly and they guide you back up to standing. And gradually the distance between the two of you gets bigger and you take slightly bigger falls and you play with trust. Mm. Right? So it's, it's a similar kind of experience that we can have in our lives. We don't, we can do it that way, but we can do it in other ways too. You know, I'm thinking of when parents are teaching their kids to drive and giving them the keys to the car, there's a lot of playing with trust that happens there too. Relationships are all based in playing with trust and testing those boundaries and seeing if it's really safe and getting the reassurances that it is. Yeah. Yeah. And knowing when we don't, feel it's safe to trust, it doesn't mean that it's really not safe to trust. It means there's an experience that we're having that we should be looking at. Is that what you are saying? Very much so. So, and, and so if we can sit in that experience, we can learn a lot and maybe that's enough, right? Maybe it doesn't have to be, well, I have to get rid of this relationship because I don't trust it. So obviously there's something the matter with it. It could just be, huh, I'm not trusting this right now. Why am I not trusting this? Let me sit in that. What do I need? What am I feeling? Yeah. So how does that work with couples? How does that process work of looking at it and, you know, using play? You were telling me a little about this before. Yeah, I have like a five step process that I do with a lot of couples. Um, and I find it to be a really magical process because what it does is it helps us look for a pattern and slow down to kind of be able to observe ourselves and each other in that pattern so that we can learn, so that we can continue to evolve, and that we can start playing with the pattern instead of fighting each other. Does that make sense so far? 
Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm just thinking to myself, how <clears throat> even seeing those patterns mm-hmm. can be so hard. And, it can be. You know, hard to even want to look at it. Yes. And so when I work with couples around this, the one thing that um, we do a lot of is we'll be looking at it in my office after an event has happened um, or after multiple events. We'll be looking for themes and things that keep coming up. Like we always have the same kind of fight. It always looks like this. And this is what happens. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of place that we want to start looking for the pattern. Often, I don't encourage people to start by looking for it while they're in the middle of it. I'd rather them look for it five days later. Gradually, they're going to start noticing those patterns while they're in the middle of it, but we don't need that, at least not at the beginning. In the beginning, we need a really calm space where they can kind of go within and see their piece of the pattern and then be able to share that and open up a discussion, a pretty vulnerable discussion with their partner that says, this is what I'm seeing. Are you seeing this too? For example, I think it was just the other day that I had a discussion like this with my husband where I said, you know, I go deep. And you like to keep things way more calm. Like you like to kind of keep things more level. You like to keep things kind of play in this lighter space. He likes to keep things lighter and I like to go really deep. And we balance each other really well there because he brings me back to the lightness and I bring him into the depth. But we don't have to compete for that. We can kind of see who needs what when. And if I need to go deep to process something, he can meet me there. And if I need to go a little lighter so that I can kind of keep it more approachable for him, then I can meet him there and we can kind of play with how we're finding each other instead of always missing each other and turning away from each other. Yeah. Will you say for people who are listening, because I think this is an important point that people don't always understand or don't always have awareness about is when people are missing each other. Can you talk about what that is? Yeah. You know, I think I'm just going to reflect for a minute on the work of John Gottman. They have been studying relationships for about four decades. And one thing that they have found is that we often make bids for attention. We will say something like, hey, look out the window and look at that bird. Or did you get the mail? Or (laughs) whatever it is. Um, Can you dry the dishes while I wash them? Can you take out the trash? All of these different kinds of things are bids for attention. We want to know that this other person in our life is paying attention and they're there. And we want to receive a reply that says, oh, yeah, I saw the bird or sure, I'll come help you with the dishes or I'll get the trash. What we what what turns us off and this is kind of pretty universal is when we get the "Mm -hmm, I did that yesterday. I don't want to do it now. Right. Mm -hmm. Whenever we kind of feel that shrug off that that's the stuff, you know, we can, we can take that stuff. We can all take it. But when we get that all the time, that makes us feel really kind of disconnected. John Gottman calls it um, that we either turn towards each other or we turn away from each other. And so in those moments, the more often we turn away from each other, this actually plays into trust because the more often we turn away from each other, the feeling of trust starts to diminish. One of the is it Brene Brown or John Gottman? I can't remember who it is that talks about the marbles in the jar. Do you know this one? Yeah, that's Brene Brown. That's Brene. I like to use that analogy pretty often in my work where they talk about this jar of marbles. And every time you turn towards somebody, it's kind of like you're depositing a marble in that jar. And every time you turn away, it's like you're taking marbles out. And so that jar of marbles essentially is kind of like the trust between the two of you. The more full it is, the more trust there is. Mm-hmm. And I want to focus on a point you made that it goes back to attachment again, because when you think about a child needing a parent's attention Mm -hmm. and the parent is distracted or for many reasons, they may not be able to give the child what they need after a while, the The child child doesn't ask. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And then they get used to that and that becomes their pattern. And so then they may grow up and be the kind of adult that stops asking who stops asking or the kind of adult who doesn't give it when their partner wants it, you know, right. they're, they're turning away. So, and that is such a deep trust um, yeah. barrier. And to, to notice also that we tend to pick mates mm-hmm. <laughs> who are perfectly positioned to help us either stay exactly the same or to help us grow. <laughs> 
right? Exactly. <laughs> so, and then we say, of, why yeah. did I marry my dad? Why <laughs> did I marry my mom? <laughs> and it's, it's really just a beautiful opportunity because we, in our adult relationships and romantic relationships, there's really an opportunity to heal childhood wounds. Yes. Or to continually reenact them. And to pass them down to future generations or to shift them and make them different. Yeah. I think one of the things that you and I are deeply united in is that we care passionately about stopping those generational cycles of perpetuating, you know, people's needs not being met or trauma or the pain. Yeah. So another thing I want to amplify that you were just talking about, because so much of what you said was really deeply rich in meaning for me. And I just wanted to take out another point. You said we make these bids for attention. Mm -hmm. And I think culturally, Mm -hmm. we say wanting attention is a bad thing. Yeah, we do. We, we say a lot of different things, you know, it's, Attention seeking Mm -hmm. is something that we look down upon, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, she Um, just wants attention. She just wants attention or or she's dressed like that. She's Mm -hmm. going out of the house like that, right? Like, so there's, there's a lot of that piece of it. And then the more meek side where she doesn't want attention, where she doesn't, you know, she's not asserting herself. She's not putting herself out there. So no matter where we fall in this continuum, we are, we're going to get a backlash from the outward world. And we have to get really comfortable internally with kind of noticing it is what, you know, that we do need. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I think people struggle a lot with the idea that to want attention is not a bad thing and to need attention at times is a human need. I think there's, there's a few really important human needs. And I think we all need to feel seen, heard and understood going back to our infancy and Mm -hmm. our toddler years and our childhoods, these are really important needs that without feeling seen, heard, and understood, we, we don't develop so well. We develop, but maybe there's shortcomings within that development, within our abilities to kind of soothe ourselves and take care of ourselves and grow into a, a fuller potential of who we are. And the same is true in our adult lives and our professional lives. There's a, there is a, really important place for that being seen. You know, Laura, I know you know that I have a professional group called the practice of being seen, because I think that even as professionals, we need to practice this art of how do you put yourselves out there? How do you get yourself into this place where you can be seen, where your ideas can be heard, where you can be understood? This isn't something that we're all great at. And even those of us who have gotten off to the best starts, who have had really attentive parents, we still struggle with this. It's, it's just not so normal to put yourself out there in that way. And yet it doesn't always mean that we've got this narcissistic, pay all your attention to me kind of part of our ego going on. It could just mean I'm trying to figure out who I am. And if you see me, then you give me a reflection and I get to learn more about myself. I get to understand better how well you're understanding me. And if this is resonating for you, then it starts to make more sense for me too. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking while um, we were talking a minute ago that, you know, the practice of being seen was what we should talk about next because um, it seemed to relate exactly to what we were talking about before wanting attention or feeling <laughs> uncomfortable with attention. And I think so many therapists are very comfortable being behind the scenes, Mm -hmm. taking care of people and encouraging people to take care of themselves in a very healthy way. But we're pretty uncomfortable with the limelight most of the time. Very much so. And and we're also groomed to be uncomfortable with the limelight. We're groomed to not pay attention to, to not make it about ourselves. And in some ways, I wonder if that also takes us even out of our own emotional experience while we are providing therapy, while we are sitting with and holding others, you know, and I, I believe that there's a lot of information in our own emotional experiences all the time. So to tune into that and to be in an observational place of that is really important, but we can't start with doing it as a therapist all the time. If it's not what we know how to do, we have to start with doing it in our own lives and doing it in our professional spheres. And so, so I think we need a holding space for that. Yeah. 
Do you want to talk about how the practice of being seen is a holding space? Yeah, uh, sure. So the practice of being seen is is growing into essentially three different branches. It started with, and it will always have, a virtual community of therapists who are are working on this very thing or who are working on trying to play with their own vulnerabilities and how much of themselves to put out there and how much of themselves to hold back. And this can be anywhere from writing a blog post or putting out a podcast or getting on stage and speaking or how we show up in a therapy room with our clients. So all of these pieces of, um, of how we do our work, of how we manifest our our outward appearance are part of the discussion and, and the community very much kind of holds a space for that discussion to happen. And we really try to see each other and see each other in that vulnerable space so that we can help take care of the feelings and the things that are emerging. Because when we can make that vulnerable space safer, we can, we can help each other grow. And that's, that's the idea behind this. We're also hoping to, um, and I do this, I facilitate this group with a storytelling coach and a dear friend of mine, Marisa Gowdy. And the two of us this fall hope to also launch a podcast called The Practice of Being Seen. And um, we also do a lot of consulting individually. But so there's, there's all of this need that we're really finding that therapists, in order to, to put themselves out there to risk being seen by others, they, they need a place where they could practice it, where they can fail a little bit and get back up because that's the work of, of learning. Yeah. So it's practice in terms of getting practice by doing something over and over. And it's also a practice, like you would have a meditation practice practice or a gratitude practice. It's something that you, it's like a muscle you have to work. It's a muscle you have to work and it's, it's a risk you have to take. And I think that the muscle that you're working and the risks that you're taking have a lot to do with that vulnerability. And what are people going to think about me? What are they going to say about me? Does my story matter? Which is why I'm working also with a storytelling coach around this, because so much of this is about the stories that we both tell ourselves and the stories that connect us to others. Kind of like how you and I have these connection points. We both really care about this kind of generational stuff that's being passed down. These are stories between the two of us that really connect. Yeah. And one of the things when you were talking, it's so funny because when you were just saying that a minute ago and and you said, right when you said vulnerability, I was thinking, I'm going to say this about vulnerability, but, um, (laughs) (laughs) you know, as therapists, um, I think I say this a lot. I mean, it's really becoming clear to me that so many therapists are not comfortable in a space of vulnerability because we want to be the ones with the answers. Mm -hmm. We want to be the ones that people turn to, to solve problems and to help, you know, help in a crisis and know what to do and how to help the person get to where they're trying to go. Um, I think that like, that's the impulse that draws us into therapy oftentimes. And so often it has a lot to do with our own stories of our own childhood, you know, the way we took care of people in our families and you know, this. Yep. Yeah. So if you could see me right now, you'd see that like my face is kind of in a great big smile and kind of (laughs) giggling along with you. But yes, we, we therapists, we're, we're wounded healers ourselves. We have our own journeys and our own humanity. And that joins us in the room. And yet when we're sitting with our clients, that's not the part of us that gets expressed. You know, one of the beautiful things about Connectfulness and the the website that I have there is it hosts a blog and I have a lot of different contributors on that blog. And one of the most recent contributors was a fellow podcaster, Robert Cox, who wrote a piece called Broken Spaces. And he talks a lot about how within each therapist, there are these wounds and the wounds within the therapist are the the places that let the light in there, the places that that our our client stories can touch us and connect to us. Yeah. And you know, we we have to be really aware of what those wounds are because when we feel touched there, we have to know like, oh, that's what's resonating. We can't just be affected without that awareness. That awareness is a really big piece. But but that's that's the work. It's being able to be vulnerable enough that we can at least notice where our wounds are. Yeah. Yeah. And we can use them. That's the gift that we have that 
we can use to help people when we have awareness, when we yes. don't have awareness and our wounds are what's happening in the room instead of us having awareness and connection to what's happening with ourselves so that we can use that to help the other person. Right. You know, it's that difference between being vulnerable, being safe, being able to safely feel vulnerable without going into your own trauma story, your own history, your own, you know, childhood coping versus, you know, so being able to hold that space with the person while you stay safe and they can be safe. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I, I often think about different experiences that I have had in different, re- in a mix of different relationships throughout my life. And I know that when I'm being vulnerable with someone, whether it's a therapist or a friend or a colleague or my husband or my mother or my sister or my, you know, like whomever it is, I know the difference between when I really feel like I could just like, let it all out with you. And I can tell you everything and I can, I can let you see my insides. And the opposite of that, where I feel like I'm quivering in my skin and and I'm feeling almost a little disembodied. Like I, I don't feel like I'm in myself anymore and I don't feel safe enough to go any deeper than that. That's it. That's my, that's my space of awareness that I need to, I need to stop and back up a little bit right here. You're yes. That's so important what you're talking about, because as therapists, when we're doing this work, our, that's what makes us be able to do it is that we've had an experience, yes. not necessarily the same experience that the client is talking about, but that we can empathize with that pain. Yes. But we, our pain is healed enough to the point where we can use it to help versus making it about our pain. And, but I think the way we do that is, you know, it, it takes so much work. It takes a lot of awareness. It takes a lot of sitting with ourselves. And sometimes that sitting with ourselves even has to happen in the middle of a session where we, we notice something within ourselves and we have to be able to get curious enough to go, what is that? I need to come back to that later. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't take over the session, but we have the, the insight to say, I'm noticing something here. Mm-hmm. And being able to be grounded enough in that session. To very, have that yeah. awareness. Yeah. And it's, it's a very similar process that's playing out for our clients. You know, when I, when I sit with people and they, they get really stoic and they stop moving and it doesn't look like they're in their bodies, I know that means something too. And when I'm working with couples, I'm constantly guiding them to watching each other's body in that kind of way, especially when the conversations get more vulnerable. Yeah, I think we can stay in our heads and we can just keep talking and they keep talking and everything mm-hmm. looks like it's okay. But if you're not noticing what's really happening and the sensations within yourself as the therapist and what the other person's body is doing, yeah. then you're missing. You're missing some really important information. Yeah. So is it okay if I if I diverge for one minute? Because yeah. I know we had wanted to touch on the animal assisted work that I'm, sure. I'm leaning into a lot. And this is why I use I, I use both my dog and um, horses in the work. This is exactly the reason why I do, because they allow us to watch their bodies and watch how they respond to us and what feels safe and soothing to them and what prickles up their hair and what makes them seem more stressed out and we can watch their stress signs and we can observe them in a way that feels a lot safer than observing ourselves and each other. Can you say more about it? Like the, the, because I've heard, and I don't know much about this, but I've heard that (laughs) the, um, you know, our self-regulation affects their self-regulation. Yep. Both with horses and dogs, there's a lot of mirror neurons. They can read. They can't necessarily mimic what our facial expressions are doing because their facial muscles aren't wired the same way, but they can read our faces. They can read our body language. They have been domesticated and grown up with us, and they they are wired to connect with us, just like we're all wired to connect with each other. So without getting too neurological about it all. <laughs> there, there's, there's a lot that's happening that's really, really subtle and happening on a much quieter, slower, not in your head, but more embodied space and playful space because play again is the glue of connection. I know when my puppy wants to play with me, she brings me her toys um, or she gets down in a, in a bow and she shakes her butt in the air. When a horse wants to play with me, he'll come over and kind of nibble on me or something like they, they they let you know when they want to connect, just like our partners do. But with them, somehow it's sometimes a little bit easier to see. 
Yeah, maybe because they can't use words to communicate. So the words aren't there as a distraction. Well, there's that because, you know, there's there's a lot of research. I think it's Amy Cuddy's research and she, she wrote a book called Presence mm-hmm. and she talks a lot about how language disrupts some of these other connections because we can we can say something that we don't really mean. But if we mute things and we don't listen to the things that are actually said and just watch the body and the facial expressions, we can actually learn more and we can learn more truths in that. Yeah, we we are so highly evolved with our cognitions that are unlike any other animal, yeah. yet it gets in the way of so much of what's really happening. So much. So do you want to say more about your your five step process? I feel like I only let you talk about the first step. Oh, that's OK. Sure, though. <laughs> there's <laughs> there's five steps um, in this process, and it's basically they're deceptively easy really deceptively easy because it's not actually this easy when you're in the moment. But step one is just to slow down and start noticing your patterns. Notice these these conflicts that you get yourselves into. And that might, again, be in the moment. It might be five days later. It doesn't matter where it falls. What matters is that you're actually just taking the moment to, to sit with it. Step two is to notice what you are or what you were feeling and what you needed. The feeling and the need, those are the two things that you want to be noticing. And the need is something that I think we are so conditioned just to ignore. So conditioned to ignore. We don't, we have a really hard time with that. So this is, this takes us into step three, where we want to actually sit down with each other in a calm space. This is not in the middle of a fight, but we want to open a discussion and we want to name those feelings and needs to one another. I feel this. I need this. There's no critique in there. You always, you never listen to me. There's no space for that. (laughs) Because as soon as, as soon as you say something to me like that, I'm going to shut down and I haven't heard the rest of anything you said. Yeah. But if, if instead you say something to me, like, I feel really scared. I just need your eyes to be connecting with mine so that I can share more with you. Hmm, that sounds a lot different. I like that one. I might, I might borrow that. <laughs> right. <laughs> because, because I'm giving you a prescription. This is how I'm feeling, but this is what you can do to help me. Yeah. I like that. Right. So, so name the feelings and the needs in this calmer time. And you want to just kind of allow those feelings and needs to, to slowly start percolating. Um, this is the fourth step to just kind of allow them to start opening up your awareness because this is that prescription. You have a really individualized prescription for your unique relationship. You're learning more through noticing this pattern, what the two of you can do differently to thrive together. And so step five is all about being kind to yourself and each other, because this is the vulnerable work of relationships, that it takes practice and patience, and it's going to be a challenge. You're going to fail at this quite a lot, but nobody's ever gotten good at something by doing it the right way the first time, right? You get good at things by trying and trying and trying. So you want to stand in the truth of those feelings and needs. You want to own them. You want to keep asking for the same thing. And you want to be able to be influenced by your partner's efforts to meet you there, but also their effort to do the same, to name their feelings and their needs. That is deep. Yeah. Simple too, but not so simple to practice. (laughs) Yeah. When you're in those conflicts and it's also emotionally flooding. Well, which is why I'm saying it's not easy to do this in the moment. This is the kind of thing that happens in introspection. It happens in therapy or it happens, you know, in your journal. That's a great place for this. Um, mm. But it, it happens slowly and it percolates over time. And once you start seeing the patterns, you can start opening discussions around those patterns. And that's where the growth happens. You have to be able to see them, though. Yeah. So is that something that if people don't know how to identify the patterns, is that something that they can learn through therapy? Very much so. I mean, that's that's a huge part of my work. We have... My couples in here have tons of aha moments just looking at their patterns. And then I have the couples who want to dig deeper and learn more about themselves and each other. And I have other couples who get really scared off by that part of the process and that's enough for them or they're just not ready for it just then. So there's there's a space in there where, you know, we have to kind of figure out kind of what we we each need. Is that is that pattern something that you feel willing to look at? Because not everybody's gonna and that's okay. We do so much to avoid uncomfortable feelings. 
You know, what was it that I saw? It was like a meme or something like that the other day that addiction, the opposite of addiction is connection. Mm hmm. Right. So I'm, I'm thinking of this, as you say, we do so much to avoid uncomfortable feelings because I think that that might just be what this is about. Right. Like we we lean into other things, whether it's more social media or drugs or alcohol or video games or Pokemon Go or whatever it is like we're doing those things because we're not fully present with something that's happening right in front of us. Yeah. Something is uncomfortable. So we need to get away from it. Yeah. Wow. And we're all, we, we all do it in our own ways. I mean, whether it's gardening or eating or like we, we, some ways are healthier than others, but we all have something that we do to, to pull us out of the things that feel uncomfortable. Well, this has been such a fascinating conversation. And, you know, since I don't do couples work, I mean, to think about this um, a little differently from my individual work is really getting my neural neurons firing or whatever. <laughs> It's been so much fun to talk to you about it. I could probably talk to you for days, Laura. I know. And I think if I were looking for a couples therapist, you're the one I would want, but we can't do that because we're friends. But. We're friends. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe we'll talk more. I can't wait until your podcast comes out. I think you've talked about so many interesting things that I think our listeners are going to want to find out more about. So tell them where they can get this information as it evolves. Yeah, I think everything is kind of evolving under the the umbrella of connectfulness. So that's C O N N E C T F U L N E S S dot com. There's portals there to to every other piece of the work, to the podcast, to the group for for mental health practitioners, for the relationship work I do with couples. It's it's all um, infused in that one place. Wonderful. Well, Rebecca Wong, thank you so much for being on Therapy Chat today. Oh, thanks for having me, Laura. It was really a pleasure. Thanks so much for listening to my interview with Rebecca Wong of connectfulness.com and the practice of being seen. As you heard me say in the beginning of this episode, I just love Rebecca. I can't get enough of what she's doing. Thanks again for listening. Please remember to visit iTunes and leave a rating and review and subscribe so you can receive all the latest episodes. That helps more people find Therapy Chat. Just another reminder that if you'd like to become a member of Therapy Chat, supporting the podcast while receiving fun member perks and being able to communicate with me one on one, go to patreon.com slash therapy chat. If every subscriber donated just one dollar per month, Therapy Chat would be able to keep going strong indefinitely. Thanks so much for your support. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.